Okay, so what was the last thing we said? We said we define this electric flux phi as electric field, if I have a uniform electric field, and the rectangular surface E dot A. Why does that make sense? Let's think of a uniform electric field. Okay, let's say that I have this nice uniform electric field in space. Now, would I be crossing more field lines if I put my surface parallel to the electric field or perpendicular to the electric field? If I want to cross more field lines, I should put it perpendicularly. Actually, if I tilt my surface, I'll actually have less field lines crossing the surface. And the angle will be just the cosine of the angle between the electric field and the normal vector to the surface. So if I have a surface, let me try to draw a side view of these things. So here is my surface. And surface vector A is in the same direction with the electric field. So if A is parallel to E, flux is maximum. On the other hand, if I tilt my surface like this, what's the number of cr lines crossing that surface? Zero. Everyone is passing above and below that <coughs> here. If electric field is perpendicular to the, the uh, area vector, then phi E is 0. So this E dot A definition kind of makes sense. But be very careful. What happens if I take another surface like this? Here, A dot E is actually negative. So there is a directionality that's imposed on this definition. I have to be careful about which way I am talking, which way I am taking the, electric, the, the, the area vector. For any given flat surface, you can define the area vector to be one way or the other. Okay. Now, so area vector definition is generally ambiguous. It's not clearly defined. We have to do a little bit more of a job to define it. Now, I said I'm going to define flux generally, but what I did so far is define it for a rectangular surface in a uniform electric field. How can I generalize this to a, let's say, a curved surface? If I have a curved surface, I don't know, something like this. Like this. How can I define the flux through that surface? That's why Newton invented calculus, right? If you can do anything for rectangles, for uniform electric fields, you can do it over curved surfaces. The only thing you need to do is, instead of thinking about the whole surface, you have to take very small areas, dA on the surface. So there will be an area vector here, and locally, <coughs> There will be an electric field. What you need to do for the surface, electric flux for the surface, will be E dot dA. That will be the small flux through this surface. But now you actually have to integrate it over the whole surface. You have to break up your surface into small rectangles. 
Now, generally, at this stage, a lot of my freshman students are scared away. They are already scared from the integral symbols. Now that I have vectors inside the integral, thinking that that's going to end up with horribly complicated integrals that you actually have to evaluate. On the contrary, while the definition is conceptually a little bit hard, we'll end up with the simplest possible integrals in the problems we solve. So do not be scared, but try to understand conceptually what we're trying to do. Did you understand the definition of electric flux for a rectangular surface in a uniform field? It's quite easy, E dot A. Now, how can I do it in a varying electric field with a curved <laughs> surface? The logic is that now that I know how to do integrals, I can break up my surface into small enough regions so that I can regard them as rectangles, okay, as flat surfaces, and then electric field in that region would be almost uniform. So E dot A over the surface will give me the total flux through any curved surface. Okay? And this is also a very strange way of writing the limits of an integral. This is, in principle, a two-dimensional integral. So I have to specify over which surface I'm evaluating the integral. Okay? Now, let's try to get rid of this ambiguity, whether I should get a, the area vector to one side or to the other side. Okay. And it turns out we'll not be concerned about the most general surfaces. We're going to consider only closed surfaces. Does anyone know the definition of a closed surface? Okay, let me give it. A closed surface is a surface which divides the space into an inside and outside region. And you cannot go from inside to the outside without crossing the surface. Okay. So, for example, if I actually take <coughs> some sort of you know, I take a bag, okay? It can be deformed, but there's a clear inside and clear outside. And if I start from any point on the outside, if I try to, uh, on the inside, if I try to go to outside, I must always cross the surface, okay? You can not go from inside to outside without crossing the surface. For example, if I have the surface of a sphere, <coughs> this is a closed surface. There is a clear inside and a clear outside. If I have a torus, right, simit, there is a clear inside and an outside. Okay. So this is again a clo closed surface. What if I have a surface like this, something with a small hole. Ah. If I have a small hole 
in my sphere. Is that a closed surface? It's not a closed surface anymore because I can go from inside to the outside from this small, this small hole. So there is no clear definition of inside and outside. Now an entirely equivalent definition of a closed surface is here the surface has a boundary but a closed surface has no boundary. If I think of the sphere surface, does it have a boundary? Is there a place that it actually stops? No, it doesn't. It's a two-dimensional thing that's embedded in a three-dimensional space, but it has no boundary. But let's stick to this maybe a little bit cruder, but more intuitive definition of a closed surface. A closed surface is something that splits the space into an inside and outside region. All right? Now, the nice thing about closed surfaces is area vector can be defined very precisely without any ambiguity. For closed surface, area vector points from inside to outside. So for example, oops, I don't know what happened here. Okay. So for example, if I have a sphere surface of a sphere, the dA vector will always point at each point towards the outside. If I have a other closed surface, let's take the surface of a cylinder. For this surface to be closed surface, do, should I have the caps on or off? Should I have the caps included in the surface? Yes. Right. So can you tell me which way is DA pointing on the upper cap? It's pointing up here. How about on the side? It's pointing out. And uh, at the bottom, it's pointing down. Okay. So this DA vector is always pointing from inside to the outside. Does it make sense? Okay. So here is the wonderful statement of Gauss's law. I'm going to claim that if I calculate the flux for, for a closed surface, it's exactly the total charge inside divided by epsilon 0. And to remind myself that I'm doing this for a closed surface, I'll put a small circle onto the integral. Okay, That means closed surface. Now, let's talk a few <coughs> moments about this. It's entirely what I said in the first lecture. Okay. What is the flux? What's the left-hand side of this equation? The way we define flux, it's the total number of field lines going out of a surface. Right? So if we go back to our too complicated drawing, I'll have to draw it again. <laughs> okay. So if I have two charges, plus Q and minus Q, and if I take a surface, closed surface, all the field lines, all the field lines coming from this plus Q, Q must go out. They are going out of the surface, so they give me a positive flux. Now, if I actually <coughs> Take another surface, if I take a surface which has 
no charge inside. There may be field lines crossing the surface, but whatever is coming in must also go out. So the total electric flux will be zero. So what Gauss's law basically tells us is if I can count the number of flux lines going out of a surface, so the net number of flux lines going out of a surface, they must have come from somewhere inside, and the only place where field lines can start are charges, so I can basically measure the charges inside this region. Now, here is something that's somewhat maybe surprising at this stage. It turns out what I write down here is equivalent to Coulomb's law. Now, it looks a little bit surprising, but you can prove Coulomb's law from this, or you can prove this from Coulomb's law. I will not attempt to do the proof, and actually, if you want to do justice to that proof, you have to learn a little bit of differential geometry. But I'll do the following. Let's calculate the flux due to a point charge. All right, that's the first thing I'll actually try to do. So let's check Gauss's law. Does it make sense? Calculate the flux due to a point charge Q at the origin. So here's my situation. I'll take my charge Q to be at the origin. And I would like to calculate the flux on a surface. Now, Gauss's law tells me it's true for any surface, but I need a surface where I can actually do the integrals. So I'll choose the most symmetric surface possible. Let me take a sphere. I wish I could draw well. Let's go back. So here are my axes. Now I'm trying to draw a sphere of radius r. This looks more like an egg, but... Okay. So, here's the problem. How do I evaluate E dot dA? What is E dot dA on the surface? Okay. Let me take any small section on the sphere. Please do not take notes. If you're sleeping, wake up. This is the time to listen, okay? How do I calculate the flux on this sphere? If I take a small section dA, which way is the area vector pointing? It's pointing outside. How about the electric field? Which way is the electric field pointing at any point on the sphere? It's pointing outside, right? Coulomb's law tells us that it's pointing outside. Actually, Coulomb's law even tells me that the magnitude of the electric field will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q divided by R square. But more importantly, by symmetry, E is parallel to dA everywhere 
on the sphere. Does everyone agree with this statement? By symmetry, electric field must be pointing away from the sphere. That's the only <coughs> direction. And dA is also pointing in the same direction. So integral e dot dA is because e and dA are parallel, I can write it as e magnitude times dA, not the vector. Okay? If two vectors are pointing in the same direction, their dot product is just their magnitudes multiplied, right? There is no cosine theta. Furthermore, the magnitude of E is the same on all points of the surface, right? Again, by symmetry, one point is not different from the other. So the magnitude of the electric field cannot change, right? So this is a constant with regards to my integration variable, which means I can take it out. Now let's come back to the meaning of integral dA. What does that mean? What was dA without the vector sign? It's the area of that small rectangle. If I add up the areas of all these small rectangles, what do I find? Total surface area of the surface, right? Whatever surface. So this is going to be the total surface area. Okay? So this is going to be E magnitude times A. And now I can... Right, E magnitude is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q divided by R square. <coughs> What's the surface area of a sphere? Come on. 4 pi R squared. 4 pi is cancelled. R squared cancelled. Q over epsilon 0. And that's exactly... I mean, what, we, what Gauss's law promised us. So we can trust it a little bit more now. Okay. At least it works for point charge. And the usual proof goes along the lines showing that if you bend the surface a little bit, it's not going to change. So And it works for point charges. It works for all charges is the next thing you actually have to prove. Okay. So... Integral e dot dA is Q over epsilon 0 checks out. Point charges. Hmm. Let's go back to the example I wanted to solve in the previous case. Okay. So how will this help us? Let's go back to the example I could not solve with integrals. It will, I said it would take a lot of time. Okay? <coughs> so, find the electric field of a uniformly filled sphere. So I have a sphere of radius r that has a total charge q. And I want to find the electric field, find E both inside and 
outside the sphere. Once again, you can do this by integration. You can split up your sphere into disks, which you can split up into rings. And rings, you can easily calculate the electric field. So basically, you have to do three integrals. You can do it. But Gauss's law actually makes it very, very easy. Okay, So let's try to do that. Now, first, find the electric field outside. So I'm going to redraw my sphere. Let's say I want to find the electric field. So this is the radius. I want to find the electric field at a radii r larger than. To be able to find the electric field, I need to use Gauss's law. So I'm going to use Gauss's law. A integral e dot dA is q in divided by epsilon 0. But to be able to use Gauss's law, I need a surface. OK? Now, this is not a real surface. It's an imaginary surface we use to solve the problem. OK? It's just the surface on which we're going to evaluate our integral. So I must choose the surface with extreme care. I must choose it so that I can evaluate my integral. So when you're choosing your Gauss surface, it must reflect all the niceties of your problem, all the nice things, all the symmetries of your problem. So here, I have a spherically symmetric problem. So the best thing is to choose my Gauss surface as a sphere. What should be the radius of the sphere? At the end of the day, I am wondering the electric field at the point which is a radius smaller away from the origin. So my Gauss surface must pass through that point. So my Gauss surface will be, I'm sorry, this is green. So this is my Gauss surface. Yes. Why did you draw the Gauss surface? Okay, so to be able to use Gauss's law, I need to evaluate this integral on some surface, right? So that's what the Gauss surface is, all right? It's the imaginary surface on which we're going to do the integration. Now, I need to calculate e dot dA on the surface. If I take any small point on the surface, which way is dA pointing? dA is pointing outside. How about the electric field? Can it point anywhere but in the same direction? By symmetry, any electric field, this is a spherically symmetric arrangement. You cannot choose another direction. You must point either away from this arrangement or into that arrangement, which is practically the same thing, right? up to a minus sign. So E and DA must look at, must point in the same direction. Does everyone understand this logic? If I have a spherical arrangement, and I would like to find the electric field here, obviously the electric field cannot choose up or down because it's symmetric. Can it choose left or right? No, it's symmetric. The only direction it can point is away from the origin. So by symmetry, E is parallel to dA on the surface. So every time I see E dot dA, I'm going to write E magnitude times dA without the vector sign. Furthermore, 
all the points on this sphere are equidistant from the charge distribution, right? I'm going to claim again by symmetry E magnitude is constant on the surface. So integral E dot dA by the first argument is integral E magnitude times dA and by the second argument it's E times integral dA. Okay? So this is going to be the total surface area which is going to be what? 4 pi r square but small r square or capital r square? It's the small r square because I am doing my integration on this Gauss surface on the imaginary surface. Great. 4 pi r square. So here's what I calculated. E magnitude times 4 pi r square. I have calculated the left hand side of Gauss's formula, Gauss's law. How about right hand side? What's Q in for this surface? What's the charge inside the surface? All the charges inside my surface, right? So this should be Q. All the charges here. Okay. So integral E dot dA is Q in divided by epsilon 0. E dot dA we've just found is 4 pi r square times E magnitude. Q in is Q divided by epsilon 0. So E of r magnitude is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r square for r greater than the radius of the circle. So, I mean, this is somewhat maybe disappointing, right? I found the formula for a point charge. But maybe it's not too surprising. Do you remember your gravity? In gravity, if I had a spherical planet, its gravitational field was as if all the mass was concentrated at the center. Okay? So, it works also for charge distributions. If I have a spherical distribution, if you're away from that spherical distribution, it behaves as if everything is at the center, all the charges at the center. Okay? So it is nice. But I'm not done yet. I actually want to calculate the electric field inside. Okay? So how about r less than r? So let me redraw my figure. So here is my charge distribution. If there's a problem, question? So I would like to find out the electric field here. It's smaller. So I need I need to calculate both the left hand side and the right hand side of this equation. On the left hand side I need a surface. I need my Gauss surface. What should the Gauss surface do? It should reflect all the symmetry of the problem. So it must be a sphere in this problem. And where should it pass from? It should pass from wherever I actually want to calculate the electric field. So I should take a Gauss surface as a sphere that is passing from my observation point. On this sphere, all the arguments I made previously apply. on the Gauss surface E is parallel to dA. 
which means integral let me not get ahead of myself integral e dot dA is actually e magnitude times integral dA which is e magnitude times integral dA and it's again going to be the total area of my Gauss surface 4 pi small r r capital R small r I am doing my integrals on this green Gauss surface okay so it's going to be 4 pi r square so the left hand side is again sorry integral e dot dA is 4 pi r square how about q in though what is the amount of charge what does q in mean what was the definition of q in all the charge inside the gauss surface so where is that charge it's inside the gauss surface so can you tell me what q in is it will be certainly not all of the charge because some of the charge is outside my gauss surface <laughs> how can i calculate the total charge inside my gauss surface let's first find the density okay what would be the density of the charge inside q divided by 4 pi over 3 capital r cube right that's the volume that is the volume density now I have to multiply it by the volume of the <coughs> Gauss surface which will be 4 pi over 3 r cube so 4 pi over 3 is cancelled apparently q in is q r cube divided by capital R cube hmm so now I can connect both sides integral e dot dA is q in over epsilon 0 this is 4 pi r square times electric field magnitude which we forgot to write here is Q R cube divided by capital R cube divided by epsilon zero. So electric field inside is Q over four pi epsilon zero. I have R square here, R cube here, so I'm left with R. R divided by R cube for R less than capital R. Wow. So this is a little bit different from maybe what you would <coughs> naively expect. So let me plot the electric field magnitude as a function of radius. When I'm on the outside, it's as if all the charge is concentrated at the center. So it's actually decaying like 1 over r square, right? So outside E is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r square. How about on the inside? What would you expect the electric field to be exactly at the center of the sphere? It should be zero, right? Everyone is giving me an electric field, but they should all cancel. And it, does it start from zero? It does. My formula tells me when r is equal to 0, it's 0. But then it increases linearly. It increases like a line. It increases with the radius. So where is the peak electric field? Exactly at the surface. And what's the peak value for the electric field? Well, I can calculate it from the right. It will be q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r square or I can calculate it from the left q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r cube times r 
But these both come to the same point. That's very good. It shows us we did something right. Okay? The value of the electric field at the surface is the maximum, and it's q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. Apart from the whatever values we find, do you understand why Gauss law is useful? Or when it's useful? That's the most important thing. It's always valid. It's as valid as Coulomb's law. But it will only help us do calculations if my system is symmetric enough, like the sphere. If I have a general arrangement, if I have the disk problem, we'll see that disk problem is not easy to solve by Gauss law. And when I mean not easy, for the purposes of physics 101, 102, your level of math, this is impossible. OK? You should stick to integration if there is not enough symmetry in your system. So actually, using Gauss's law is easy. You must just recognize in which situations you can use it to calculate the electric field. Let me repeat again. Gauss law, conceptually, is that's actually very simple. It just tells us that field lines start and end up at charges. It's also easy to apply. Instead of evaluating integrals, we're basically doing the simplest integrals, which are conceptually a little bit complicated. But as a third thing, we must use it. We can use it to calculate the electric field only if the problem is symmetric enough. And by solving enough examples, we'll understand where we can actually uh, apply Gauss law. All right? Any questions? I'm worried. I've told you something that's very complicated and no one is daring to ask a question. That's worrying. So in two days, we'll actually meet again, and we'll talk a little bit more about Gauss law. We'll look at under which conditions it helps us calculate the electric field. OK? See you on Wednesday.